Well, everybody knows the Zimbabwean voice now, so that's for sure. And it's a beautiful voice, that one. One of unity, one of togetherness, one of peace, one of love, you know. That's the way forward. Oga, Oga. From the African Highway Podcast Network, this is Zimbabwean Voices, the podcast where we shed light on Zimbabweans doing positive work in our community to shift the Zimbabwean narrative for the better. For episode eight, I had the honor and privilege of speaking to Sereya Isof. She is the founder of two nonprofits, the first called Kites for Peace, the second called the Zimbabwe Cares Network. Kites for Peace is a nonprofit that focuses on bringing social change and social engagement through using arts and recreation as a, as a conduit. And Zimbabwean Cares Network is an umbrella organization that acts as an umbrella to many different NGOs throughout the country doing positive work. The main thing I took away from this interview was one central theme, which is learning to acknowledge the problems that exist in our society, specifically Zimbabwean society, but not focusing on them, but choosing instead to empower and help the people that are actually helping solve the problems on a day-to-day basis, specifically in the nonprofit space. I loved it, and I hope you guys love it too. Enjoy. So the reason why I wanted to have this call was because you touched on something very important, which is um, how does one help? How does get involved? How does one get involved? Whether from the diaspora or even locally, and I think sometimes the way in which people can tangibly distill this idea into like a granular form is by looking at the story of someone and getting a sense of to how did a person go from inspiration to actually being on the ground tangibly helping people i think that's one of the lenses through which people can get that inspiration from you in any way shape or form if that makes sense um but before i get into that i think you talked on the idea of this involvement dream is to leave um my question for you is are so, for example, I've, as, as I mentioned to you before, I live in Johannesburg, right? And, and I've also, I was a, a university, I was abroad in the UK. But the dream, of course, you leave, and then you leave. And I know what it's like to, of course, have left and also come back to Zim for two years and left, then leave again. And you say, oh, I made it out. I can breathe again. And then you build a life and then you get in a part. You don't know more things that a 20-year-old should do. You get a job, you have rent, you buy furniture, and you do all of these things. And then you have more than you need, quite frankly. And yeah, they're sitting there like, I've done the things that I wanted to do in my 20s. But then there's still a piece that's missing, which is, yes, fine, you're comfortable and you have these things, but is that it? Is, is that it? So this is it, right? Um, you've talked about family. Your mom and dad are still back home then, Sim. It is to some degree burning in, in many ways. And I think that there are a lot of people who have sat in the same boat where you leave, you fulfill the dream, quote unquote, but it's still unfulfilling. Yeah, so it's sort it's of like a, like, yeah. like a midlife crisis, you know. Um, exactly. The, so sort of like when you you reach, um, you know, the, the the stereotypical midlife crisis when you you reach that mm. stage in your life where you ticked all the boxes and you're like, yeah. now what? Why am I still not happy? I'm supposed to be happy. I'm supposed um, to yeah, be happy. Yeah, so yes. it's it's definitely um, it's definitely uh, it's very real. I think that's that's very real and and it's all the time almost every day i'm hearing i'm, I'm missing home something's missing mm. something's missing mm. Mm. Yeah. and my contention is that i don't think the two are mutually the idea of being able to be contribute uh some that is invested and connected and giving back i think both people have roles to play. They're of course, the people like yourself who are closer to the action, closer to the details and have a more factual perspective around what's going on on the ground. But then similarly, there must be a world in which both people in the diaspora and people on the ground can bring the best of what's going on to almost collaborate to, you know, to bring whatever change or touch whatever life um, in whatever way they can. So I thought that's what the lens which I wanted to have this conversation was, which is to touch on that idea. Um, but before I kind of get into that, it's like, how are you coping? I think the past year, of course, has been a bit hectic. How have you been? How, how have yeah. things been, you know? Um, yeah, it, 2020 was not a good year um, yeah. it, uh, for everyone. So not, you know, um, I'm not going to say that I had it worse than anyone else. 
Um, mm. But it was kind of, it was a time where you just, um, you just hold onto your boat and now you're waiting for the tide to come in. You can't, you can't really do anything. You can't plan anything. Mm. Um, but having said that, 20, 2020 was bad, but 2019, which was a, a year of relative normality, 2019 was a really bad year. How so? And I, I think that I think that mm-hmm. uh, we forgot how bad 2019 was because 2020 was such a shock and it was such a cha- such a change. Mm. But in 2019, there was already that um, that that vibe had already started. Um, we uh, people were a really really tired of. Um, of the uncertainty of the financial hardships of the um of, of just the situations that they found yep. themselves in unemployed underpaid overworked um difficulties in doing the most simplest things you know mm, um mm. i know this because in 2019 i was already um i was already uh had i already was chatting to my youth my youth groups about yes dreams. and yes the, the, it was like it's almost like over the years the dream has become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and less and less youth were dr- actually having dreams or any ambition at all so you'd have a school leaver um whereas you know i mean years ago they were like this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna yeah um, i'm gonna get this qualification i'm gonna come back i'm gonna get this job and then i'm gonna start something and i'm gonna set my mm. parents up mm. Dream that they had, or, or what they want to achieve in their career and their life, and that dream got smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. In 2019, it was it was non-existent. The only ambition that that the youth had in 2019 was to leave. I so not I even not even I want. To, I just need to get on a plane. I need to get on a plane. I need to get, I need to get out of them. That was when I say 2019 was bad. It was bad because there was no hope. Um, people had already were already they were already giving up, um, and mm. in, in in so many ways, um, you, you know, it, it was just it was across the board. It was on, not only the youth, but I use the youth as my measure because that's who I communicate with. That's you exposed that's to the, the sure. population group um, that I communicate with the most, and asking mm-hmm. them like. How's it going? What are we going to do? How can I help you to get there? Um, let's mm. talk about, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think really by 2019, there were, there were very few, um, uh, there were very few dreams, you know, there were very few yes. um, young people who, were actually, who actually had a five-year plan or, or, or had anything. Um, and, yeah, I, I think, I think, 2019 was it was it was really it wasn't good <laughs> um, for me yeah. personally um, yeah. as well. I think 2019 a, a lot of things came came to the surface, a lot of things came to light, um, and yeah. So I think I think we started. I think 2019 was really hard. 2020 was really hard in a different way. Um, mm-hmm. Beginning to see a bit of the light again, um, mm-hmm. and just kind of hoping that when we do return to a normal, we're not going to be returning to a 2019 normal, you know? Um, yes, yes. Uh, so you know, I, I think before we rush to get back to normal, we have to mm-hmm. see if normal is actually worth returning to, that kind of normal. Um, mm. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so it's tough. So it's tough, to, for lack of a better word, it's, it's, been, it's been challenging. It's been challenging. It, it's been challenging and um, I can say for myself as well that my dreams um, mm. and, and and my goals also have been like completely um, sh- uh, you know they've they haven't shrunk they've been frozen um, mm. in a kind of like in this state of um, let's wait and see and I think so many people are there let's wait and see so the perpetual the, the, the perpetual Zimbabwean expression we're just waiting exactly. to see we're waiting to exactly. see yeah, and, tell and me, if, you have, tell me, mm. if you have kids like me, that's mm. the only thing that's ticking is you're watching them get old. Okay, um, we're seven years away from university, and uh, now we're five years away from university age, and then you start, wow. you start panicking. 
I really need to make a plan. I really need to have a five-year plan now, you know what I mean? Um, mm. So that's the only thing that's, that really kind of puts, puts pressure on you is when, when, you have, um, when you have those kind of limits. Um, I, had, I, had a friend with a, I had a conversation with a friend and we talked about the idea of hope and how Zimbabweans secretly, I think as the years have gone on, we don't believe in hope anymore. Because there's this sentiment that when you hope, you open up yourself up to possibilities. And then whenever you open up your heart just a little bit, sometimes those possibilities get dashed down. So even the idea of like a positive story, we, we, even that in and of itself, we try and not embrace it too much. Because if we embrace it too much, we're almost waiting for the opportunity in the moment where that hope will be dashed and squashed into the ground, which is so cynical, but, I, but it had an element of truth. So my question for you is, what does hope look like? Is there still room for hope, one? And, and, you know, in this time, in this space that we're in, what does hope even look like, do you know? Is it just survival? Can we get to the, the idea of thriving? Is that still a realistic ambition? I think, well, of course, maybe I'm in a cushy situation. People might think, oh, but of course you can think that way. Um, with you being on the ground, do you think that that's a realistic ambition to even have at this point? Um. I'm not a prophet. Um, mm. So I, I get asked this question a lot. You know, it's rare. You're always talking about hope. And um, mm. I, yeah, I, I take a lot of flack for it, you know, when, 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 when I talk about hope. Um, and I always say, I'm not a prophet. I can't tell you everything's going to be okay. I can't tell you that coronavirus is not going to get, I can't tell you these things. I can't give you yeah. those assurances. Yeah. Mm. Um, but what I can tell you is, if you can have hope in, in, in anything, in any one thing, is you have hope in yourself. You have hope in your spirit, in your determination, in your um, abilities. You know, um, that's one thing that you actually have control over is, mm. is yourself. So you say you can, you can have faith in yourself and say, mm. these challenges that lie ahead of me, um, I have faith that I'll be able to, to overcome them. Um, because mm -hmm. I am X, Y, Z, I am, I am, I have all of these strengths. Um, and I think that's the one thing that, that people need to keep in mind. And, and this is why we have this, this high level of suicide um, and, and mm -hmm. people just giving up. When you say people give up, what do they do? Um, you know, so often you like, um, someone, you just feel like saying, I give up. And you're like, okay, you give up and then what? Mm -hmm give up mm. are you just going to stay in bed all the time all the time well, what do you mean you give up you have to get up you have to you have to do things keep moving um, mm -hmm. otherwise you die but and some people do some people just totally give up and they they take their life and they can't take it anymore and that is that is the tragedy of um having a lack in hope so it, it's one thing to give up hope in a situation but then it's another thing to completely uh, give up hope in yourself um, mm. where you feel so totally um, incapable of dealing. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, like you say, you, you, the impression is that you're, you're comfortable. Um, and it's the same with me. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm, you know, um, mm. I, have, I have been blessed. I've been privileged. Um, yes. But yes. we also all have problems, you know. So we, we can't measure. And the problem is when we start measuring and we start looking turning on each other and we're saying you can't talk because you're sitting in your, right. in your castle right. in the uk and and um what do you know that's not the way to deal with this um so i think so, so that's like where a lot of my work comes in and like when i deal with the youth and the children um and and really anyone the whole kites of peace movement is all about um having this this hope you know this this when i talk about inner peace it's about um being at peace that even if the situation is not okay, you will be okay. And a lot of that has to do with your mental strength um, mm -hmm. and, and your, your stamina, your, your, your mental stamina. It, it's something that I, I touch on a lot um, is, mm -hmm. your, is your mental strength um, mm -hmm. because it won't change your situation, but it will change you. Yes. Um, and it, it's not an easy thing. I mean, you know, sometimes when I talk about it, I feel like I'm being so flippant and, and very casual about it. It's not an, it's, it's not huge. An, 
you can't tell you can't tell someone look on the bright side i mean sometimes some people say that and i just want to you know you want to hit them <laughs> yeah. what, what bright side what are you talking about i can't see it um so yeah and and i mean i think it a lot of things um border you know touch that as well and, and religion and faith um mm-hmm. sometimes can really help and sometimes it sometimes it angers people um, when when you say maybe you should pray about it, you know, again, that's another thing. People just want to shake you and say, what do you mean pray about it? Um, you know, so, yeah, it, it's tricky. It's very tricky. It's tricky. Sure. I think you touched on this. And thank you so much for sharing that. But you touched on a very interesting idea of having hope in oneself as a baseline. Like that's the, the thing you cannot lose out of is giving hope on yourself. I find it interesting because if you look at your life, and I'm going to get to that, it's you have, of course, kept faith in yourself, but I think you've almost, in many ways, built a life to some degree on having hope in others and their hopes and dreams, which I find very interesting. And I think that comes from somewhere and we'll, and we'll get to that work that you do, but it has to come from somewhere. So I'm going to just ask, I think, and I'm going to take it back so that people can see what that journey comes from because some of them, that must have come from somewhere. It didn't just kind of, you know, fall from the sky. So, you know, was that, I know you may, I was, read, I was reading, that you were born in Quaker. So maybe take us what that was like. Take us back there and tell, you know, tell us a little bit about that upbringing. Uh, mm-hmm. um, yeah, my my biggest ambition growing up was to leave Quaker. <laughs> that was my dream. <laughs> that was my dream. So there or you, you go. succeeded. Um, or you yeah, succeeded. I, I, I didn't go very far. I, I, landed up, <laughs> I landed up only 200 kilometers away in Harare, but I still escaped Quaker <laughs> because um, like, I was, like I was telling you before about you know about the big city and and yeah the, the small town um it, it yeah it, it was different um i grew up there it, i had a lovely childhood um very normal i was my, my sisters i'm way older than me so i pretty much grew up an only child um i'm the youngest and um yeah happy normal um i was diagnosed with diabetes um when i was young very young um i was right. only 10 years old so it's it's been it's been many years, um, and then I was at boarding school here in Harare. And and okay. sorry on the on the diabetes board, was that like a quite because it's a young age to get diabetes was that a bit of was it a life altering moment if you will just you know where you feel like oh I have this condition did it did it feel like a burden or was it just something that you kind of took in your stride? You just I mean it's again like I said what it, what choice do you have? It is what it you is. You just move. It, it is, is what, what it is. It is. <laughs> It is what it is. And, and the whole time, mm. I mean, all these adults around me were speaking out and I was like, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> um, you, you know, like you're freaking out, but it's, it's, not, yeah. it's not helping me. I've, I've still got to take four injections a day. Um, mm. By you sitting here and crying and asking all these questions, it's, it's not changing anything. And I think from a pretty young age, um, I kind of developed that, you know, what's the fuss about? Just get on with it. Let's get um, this insulin in. Let's get the insulin let's get in. Insulin. Let's, let's, let's just, figure it out. Let's just do it. Like, <laughs> I want to just, I want to stop all of this. Let's just mm. go with now, just make it part of the flow so that I can get on with mm. being a Whatever. kid. And I can get, yeah, from, from a young age, I was already, um, I was already questioning what all the panic and all the stress and all the anxiety was about. Um, mm. And I think it must've been very difficult for my parents. I mean, um, all those years ago, I mean, we didn't have the internet. They were just kind of scraping together information from here yeah, and there. Yeah, and then, of course, yeah. you get the, you know, players, you know, who will come and say, somebody told my mother that I'll be blind by the age of 30. And um, I probably never have kids because diabetic pregnancies are so, so difficult. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Um, I'll probably lose my my toes and then I'll lose my leg. Um, I mean, the stories were just, but I mean, that was the Out, 90s. Outlandish. So. Right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was crazy. And then- so, yeah. And again, I, 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 I you know, I, I didn't, I didn't take on that stress. I, I just said, it's something, we just deal with it. We just get on with it. With it. Um, and I just want to, I want to sort that so I can get on with life now. I've got I want, I want to do stuff. I want to, you know, um, yes. and so I did. And um, I think that coping mechanism has really helped me a lot. Um, mm. 
often your thoughts about the problem is more of a problem than the problem itself. If that makes, if that makes any sense. You blow it up to a much bigger proportion than it actually is. Yeah. Like you start. Uh, mm. um, and diabetes is huge. I mean, I've, I've ended up in hospital a couple of times. I was in the diabetic coma just before my mm-hmm. O-levels, mm-hmm. just before I wrote my O-levels. Um, I didn't fail, uh, which was, which was a miracle. I, I still did okay. I, I didn't do well enough um, for uh, mm. honors. I didn't have a white blaze or anything, but that was fine. Wait, tell me. So I, I read about this actually. I, so, I, so firstly, on the on the on the the coma, imp- that's really tough. I have a friend who has diabetes and he had a hypoglycemic attack, and I've been close when that's happening. And it's just like a very scary thing. Um, the the thing that kind of illuminates me from that and i'm so well done on getting through that the talented thing is the white blazer is still the thing that's that's getting to you all all these years <laughs> all these years later it was like i think i think you my sisters the white also, yeah i think my sisters also were you know when you grow up and you're you're like very very young um and your sisters are way older and already you you're still kind of very small and you're seeing your sisters achieving all these things you've got pretty big shoes to fill, you know, and yes. nobody put pressure. Yes. Um, but obviously I was encouraged and I was pushed and I was, you know, I had that expectation on myself. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I, w- I wasn't an honest student and I came out of it and I was like, oh, um, I'm still okay. The sun mm. is still rising. <laughs> um, the sky is still blue. The grass is still green. How is this possible? I didn't achieve what I wanted to always achieve. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, it, and you think about it now, it's, it's, it's the most absurd thing, you know, to put yourself under that kind of pressure. And, um, but yeah, the, the, the coma didn't help. I was in for about three weeks. Um, yes. And there was a long recovery period. It was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. again that also just that also just reinforced that idea of why am I why am I putting myself in this hell? Why am I putting these mm. expectations on myself? Mm. You know? mm. um, and and also the societal expectations. So again, like now dealing with the youth, um, they have mm. these ideas, um, or they rather they had these ideas that I will be successful when I have. You know, and then they have different, they have different goals. I want a house. I want a car. I want, um, you know, I want my children to go to the school. They kind of have this vision. I want to get married by this age, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, that dream is kind of shrinking. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of these who are like, um, I'm just going to stay with my parents now. Um, and then some of them will be like, if I need to get married, then my, my wife or my husband will just, you know, I'll have to move in with my in-laws or my wife will have to mm. move in with my parents. So mm. again, there's that, there's that kind of, that change. But yes. it's, again, it's about, it's about handling those expectations with the youth and telling them um, it's okay if you don't have a car, you know. Um, but yes. it's these mm. things that we perceive to be status. And that we perceive uh, perceived markers of success, and and nobody when you compare yourself to your peers um, overseas and you say how is he thirty years old and he's already got his own house, he's got his own car, he's got a job. It's economics. He's, he's, yeah. yeah, it's only really economics. And it's economics, again, so. it's, they they want that, but um, but it's it's not it's not possible. But due to no fault of themselves, of, of these, it's not their fault, you know. And yeah. so again, it's, it's very tough dealing with that psych- that psychological issue. Um, yeah, you spoke on, like, on the white blazer issue, you actually, it's, I just I just find it funny, because, not that, I'm sorry you didn't get the white blazer, by the way, but you're just, you're the second ever, two of these conversations. Um, and where did you go to high school, out of curiosity, if I may ask? Oh, I was a Chizzy, Chizzy PT. This, this Chizzy PT white blazer thing is ruining a lot of, yeah, <laughs> it was a similar. She's a future girl as well. Oh. And she said, and and she and she similarly, her name was Tina, and she was she had endometriosis at the same time of this of her O levels, and then she she got I think 
probably 90, 80% of her grades were A's and maybe a few B's. And then she was annoyed because she didn't, she missed the white blazer. Then I remember being like, this is just absurd that people are still wish. And obviously in, in, in retrospect, she also looks back and laughed and says, this was ridiculous. That like, this is not even the most important thing. But at that time, it seems like it's the, <laughs> the biggest thing. Um, and then you spoke, I there guess, you then you spoke about expectations and managing expectations. So like, and then how maybe they, whether it's a white blazer or whether it's, you know, having a wife, a house, a car in 10 years or so. Um, how do you manage the expectations of youth people? I mean, I'll get back to your life, but in terms of you touched on youth and youth expectations, hopes, dreams, how do you manage that bridge between, I don't know if, I don't want to use the word realistic, but ambition is good. Ambition is, there is room for ambition in life, but then also like nursing that ambition in the context of the economy in which a person exists. Do you know, how do you say like, look, you should be ambitious, but also, hey, don't get too hard on yourself because of X, Y, and Z, you know? How do you yeah. manage that with your so, youth? Okay, so I, I answer this question um, in almost every, mm. um, every conversation that I have about goals um, because goal setting is so important. So it's important to know, um, you need to know your purpose so that you can move along your path and your mm. path needs to have... Um, your path doesn't have an end destination. So the, the end goal of your path is death, right? So that's, that's what's at the end of your, of your path. But you have those little <laughs> milestones on your path. Um, I want to achieve this. I want to achieve that. I want to achieve that, right? <laughs> um, and, and people often ask me, so Surya, when so when you started this whole thing, what was your goal? What was your, and I'm like, I, 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 I knew that I wanted, uh, I wanted to achieve this. I didn't know what, I didn't have an expectation of the scale. I didn't have ex an ex expectation of the timeline. Mm. So this is something I, again, I tell um, my youth and my students a lot is have goals, but be wary of your expectations. Because again, your expectations can, um, can really uh, lead to disappointment and they can really um, make you feel down on yourself. And mm. um, again, you don't know, and, and you, you'll see other people succeed and you say, but they're in the same economy. How are they managing? How are they succeeding? Mm. You know, yeah. you can't compare your journey. And also you can't, you can't measure, you can't um, measure what might happen. So mm. you can say, mm. I have this goal and it, on, again, you've seen this so many times, it's a straight line, straight line to your, to your goal, but there's mm -hmm. up and down and up and down. And there's sometimes, it's, it's, fast, it's, sometimes it's, it's a plateau, you know, mm -hmm. it's, um, and you, there's so many things that you can't, uh, you can't predict. And I would mm -hmm. say, okay, um, when you're six months into your studies, you're going to be facing this issue. Um, so mm -hmm. prepare for it. You know, because you think mm -hmm. that preparation is just going to um, pave the way and it's going to smoothen the way for everything. You should be prepared. You should always be really, really, really prepared. But yes. expect the unexpected. Um, and don't get down on yourself um, if you don't meet your goals. So have a goal, sure. mm -hmm. but manage your expectations in terms of scale and in terms of, in terms of time. Size and time, um, yeah. I think. Uh, really, uh, really, really matter. You you need to you need to handle that. And, um, if you only sure. achieve what you wanted to achieve in ten years, um, you need to be okay with that. with that for sure. I I I read something recently where it's it's not. I think sometimes not to say that goal setting is bad, but what's more important, you touch on purpose, which is very important. But then what's most important isn't say that it's intention, and intention. If the goal, what if you set a goal and you don't hit it? Oh, you feel like what was me. But if your intention is to maybe touch lives, if you if you can put it that way, that can happen throughout a 10, 15, 20 year, and intention will continuously exist fluidly. But if but goals sometimes when you don't hit them, you feel depressed. But if you have intentions, your intention is a perpetual forward motion. So I think maybe it's teaching people that that should be the outlook as opposed to, but it's hard when you're young because you want to measure up and look left and right. I want a house, I want a car, I want these things, these markers to validate my purpose. But um, 
but alas but but i think with you like okay that. so when you had you know what i mean that, that makes sense I, 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 like, I like that word that that word intention i think it, it kind of wraps everything nicely in a in a bow and and like you said um when you move with intention um mm. then then you you move smoother um like you said when when you when you hit those uh when you don't hit those goals those targets you get mm. really down and a lot of people just quit it's not it's it's just not working out you hear that and they just throw everything it's just not working mm. out it's just not mm. for me and they they quit um i read something really cute this morning that uh, um usain bolt said i trained four years to run nine seconds <laughs> you know um, yeah. <laughs> you know so so mm-hmm. yeah you, you you again you 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 got to put in the work and mm. it's so easy for us to say don't quit don't quit don't quit and there's times where you actually should quit. Um, yes. And I tell this yes. to them. Sometimes you just, you're just feeding, uh, you know, you're just pouring into a hole with a bucket. No when to quit. But there's some things um, that you really shouldn't quit on. And again, that's the difficult thing. Like, they're like, what? Mm. How do I know that? Him. well it depends on you you can achieve anything ha <laughs> ha you know hooray and i'm going to cheerlead for you on the side <laughs> meanwhile you're actually wasting your time you're wasting your effort you're wasting your money so again it's all very you know it it really uh, only so much is dependent on you um mm. a lot of it is dependent on the external and yeah so it's, it's this constant sure. uh, juggling you kind of juggling while walking a tightrope over a volcano <laughs> <I'd say>. mm. <laughs> Mm, um, no, fully, yeah. fully. Yeah. You've just, okay. you've, you've, like you said, intention is just so important. It encapsulates it. And so and that, that leads me to my next question, which was when you were in high school, I'd, whether it was a goal or intention, um, of course, you didn't get the cream blazer, but it wasn't the end of the world. There's so much more to look forward to. What were your, you, you talked earlier about you have kids now and they have dreams. What were your dreams at that particular point in time, you know, when you're in high school? What did you want to be? if I can call it that, or were you just not even, were you just drifting, you know? <laughs> no, I wasn't drifting. I wasn't. I, I very much knew what I was going to, um, I was going to be a pharmacist, um, like my big sister. Mm. Why? And that was oh, my, course, well, it, yeah. I was going to say why, because of course your sister was a pharmacist. Because my sister, and she was, I mean, she was amazing. Yeah. Um, mm. And she still is amazing. Uh, but mm. yeah, she, you know, I wanted to be a pharmacist. I wanted to go into, into um, the science field and, um, I thought that that was that was it because again mm. you you see things and you ideal um, idealize uh, idealize certain things um, mm. uh, and again I didn't put much work into my own path. Who am I? Mm. I'm more than someone's little sister, you know. Mm. Um, who's you know I I needed to carve my own path, and the the great thing about um, not getting that white blazer and not achieving that um, was that it forced me to kind of reevaluate. Okay, now now everything is totally not not on the path that I had expected. I was expecting a a, a, a white blazer, honors at O level. I was expecting to fly through my A's. I was expecting to go to university and 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 be a pharmacist. And then I was, you know, I mean. I, I was basically following exactly what she was doing. Um, mm. And suddenly the first, you know, like the first milestone and I've, I've faltered, I've failed. Um, and it kind of forces you to say, okay, so now I'm not on her path. Now, what am I going to do? Um, and yeah. And then you kind of have to find out who you are. I mean, I was very young at that time. I was only 16 um, what did but, that work look like? What did the work look like? You talked about that introspective work. What did that look like? Was it just thinking and writing and pondering? And, you know, what did that look like? You know? A lot of writing. Um, I, I've always been a writer. I use writing as therapy. Um, mm. And again, it was like, I don't know. Like, I need to find myself. I'm, you know, I love art. I love, I love poetry. I love reading. I love, uh, what do I love? Who am I? You know? Mm. Um, and then you kind of, uh, start finding yourself and, and, and ex- actually exploring, but also allowing yourself to like things um, and allowing yourself. Allowing to, yourself to like things. Allowing yourself to actually like things. Like the whole time, 
you know, um, really, really like art. I really like um, doing, or I, I, you know, all these things, but I, it was never on my plan. <laughs> mm. It was never on my plan. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, sometimes um, when you... When so you, you felt constrained. That, you, do you feel like you've almost felt before you felt constrained, like I'm, I have this I have this particular narrow-minded view, and if I start to yeah. like art, I'm deviating from this particular thing. Even though I might want, yeah. I'll be interested in it, but I'm like, no, it will break the mold, which isn't helpful for the cause. So you said, let me allow myself to actually... You know what? Unashamedly, I like art. That's it. Yeah. You know? It's 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 allowing yourself. And again, it's about societal mm. expectations and, and family expectations. And what will my friends think of me if they're going off to do medicine and they're going off to do physiotherapy or whatever? And I just want to be a teacher. You know, what are they going yes. to say? Like, yes. I'm just going to be a teacher. Um, you know, and you really, people really look down on 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 so absurd it's so silly but if you love it um you know why would you not why mm. would you not do um i don't i don't know what kind of pharmacist i would have made um but i know that i'm happy where i am now um mm. and yeah i mean it's it's a, it sounds so silly and so meaningless but i think sometimes um turning these these um disappointments um, into something, it, it, it can actually, um, it can change things for the better, you know. Um, there's, there's so many sliding doors. There's so many yes. sliding doors, you know. Yes. Um, what, what if I, you know, what if I had never uh, ended up in Harare? What if I had ended up overseas? My whole life would be different, I, I, you know. Right, um, right. But there's, there's so many sliding doors. And um yeah, but I think it's about it's about wanting your life as it is now, wanting what you have, not not having what you want. Um, so say more on that. So what you mean? So you're saying wanting you, so having what you want versus wanting what you have. So this is me. I'm Soraya. Say more. Yeah, just unpack that a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, so again, like I said, I you know you um, I want um, oh, I'll give you an example of my car. I would really really like um, uh, a Range Rover. I'd re- I'd really like one, um, but uh, yeah, I have a Toyota, mm-hmm. and I love mm-hmm. it. And I've I've scratched it a couple of times. I've dented it a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, the I've, I've I've had to replace the shock several times with our atrocious roads, but I love my mm. car. Um, mm. And I it's what I have, and I want it. Um, I'm not dissatisfied with it. Um, so I don't have what I want, but I want what I have. Like I'm mm. I'm content. I want I'm what I own. I want what I have. So a car is such a material, shallow thing to talk about. But it, in the, if you think about it in, in terms of your of your greater life, um, uh, is this the life? Do you have the life you want? Do you have the life you've always wanted? And when we say we want the life we always wanted, we don't want to worry about money. We want to be traveling. We want to have mm-hmm. uh, the best of everything. We want to drive the best cars. And, you know, um, everybody wants that but not everybody has that, but where you find yourself now, do you want that? Do you want what you have already? It's always good to to want more, but what you have already, are you happy with it? And um, what if I'm not? It it brings me back to this whole living in the moment thing, living in the present, you know? Um, Do you want to die not having, not having ever been happy? So I'm not saying that you should be contained mm. to the point where you've got no ambition to work for something more. You should always want more. You should always want something better. Um, mm. But do you actually appreciate where you are now, what you have now? Do you ever, like, at the end of the day, sit back and say, I'm actually quite, I'm actually quite happy right now as I am. Mm. Like, I want mm. more. But for now, I'm, I'm okay. I'm happy. Um, and so few of us do that and just take that time to say, 
Um, I'm grateful for what I have. I'm, I'm proud of myself for achieving what I've done. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where, where I actually am today. I do mm-hmm. have ambition for where I want to be tomorrow, but I'm actually okay. Again, it's about managing expectations. Expectations. And it's, about, it's about loving your life now. And um, I've, lost, I've lost friends my age, younger than me. And I just often wonder, like, you know, I really hope, I really hope that they were happy because, you know, at this age, uh, you know, when you're this age, you, you're still building, you feel like you're still building a life. And then you get mm-hmm. to a certain age um, and then it's like, oh, whoops, I'm old now. Now is the time for me to sit back and say, actually, my life was quite good. But during the time, mm-hmm. in the time, you weren't. And when people die young, um, then you realize that. And you think, Gosh, the they were so busy the building. Jesus. They were so busy building. Did they ever just, Sit in the shade of what they Embrace. Got. Yes. Yes. You know? Yeah. I fully, I fully appreciate that. That's so poignant. And, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we we'll maybe to bring it back a little bit. You throw a caution to the wind and say, I'm teaching now. I don't care. Um, I am being truer to myself. I'm not going the pharmacist route. And what did that journey, what did that point look like from going from, you know, O levels to to teaching. Oh gosh, you want that story really? Is it a, is it a, is it a long one? Is it lengthy? Yeah, it's, it's very long. It's very long and winding. Um, so after my O's, I did my A's. I, I managed my A levels. Um, and then I was like, okay, I don't want to do pharmacy anymore. I'm going to do optometry. I was still on this. Wait, you had started school or you you'd started the program or not? Or you're still thinking, is it in your brain? This is it in your brain or you're still No, I actually, I actually went to the UJ, which was Rao at the time. Yes. And I yes. actually was accepted to do optometry. <laughs> I was actually accepted to do, to do optometry. And if I tell you what year this is, this was in, I'm going to give away my age, but it was a very, very long time ago, right? It's called um, Rouse, so it's called Rouse. It's just a very long time ago. And I registered in everything. And then they said, the woman started speaking to me in Afrikaans. And I was like, sorry, you need to speak to me in English. And then she said, I'm sorry, my dear, if you don't speak Afrikaans, you can't come to any of our lectures because all our lectures are still in Afrikaans. I was like, mm-hmm. sorry, what? Aren't we in the new South Africa? Isn't this like the new South Africa? Like, how is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> we're still changing everything and don't worry in, in by next year and I was like no I, I can't just take the year off I've, my, my dad's already bought me a little a mini fridge to, to put in my dorm room <laughs> I'm already I've already got friends you don't understand yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and then my dad said okay why don't you just do um why don't you just do the beginning of a of a BCom see how it goes if you still want to um, if you still want to pursue uh, your BCom after the year, then you can continue. If you want to do Optom after the year, then continue. Mm-hmm. And I started a BCom. Um, enjoyed that much. Um, mm-hmm. And I found, as I found, actually, I, I went to a counselor and they said to me, why don't you try doing um, a, a BCom with psychology? And I was like, really, is that possible? Like, what is psychology going to, you know, what does that have anything to do with the business degree? And um, they then, I, I discovered industrial psychology, which is basically human resources. But there was a whole yep. module on psychology, which I just lapped up. I, I mean, I would mm. read this book all the time, like even for fun. And, and, and you know, your lecturer would say, okay, skip mm. that section. I was like, no, 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 wait a minute. Like, no, I, let's, we have to. <laughs> so that, I mean, like now that I'm a teacher, that is ideally what you want. You want your kids to be so engaged and interested in the subject matter that they don't even feel mm-hmm. like they learn. It doesn't even feel mm-hmm. like a, a chore or mission. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really enjoyed the psychology side of it. Um, I graduated um, with my BCom in industrial psychology. I graduated with honors. I did, I did really, really well at uni. Um, mm-hmm. And then I came back and um, I went back to Quickwave. And 
a lot of people were from Johannesburg from Johannesburg to Quickway Johannesburg to Quickway um but I had I had promised my parents that I was going to come and spend time with them um and I now that my mom is late I I have absolutely no regrets in in doing mm. that um mm. because I had been at I had been at boarding school for for six years I had been at university for four years I was 10 years away from um from my family basically it left mm. when I was 12 but I'm back when I'm 22 you know um and they said we we really we would really like to have you at home mm. so um I stayed at home I, I got a job um in a I mean it's so hard to get a job in quickly <laughs> I got a job at a school <laughs> Um, I got a job at a school uh, that I was one of the pioneer. I was in the pioneer class of the school. So mm. I was like grade one when the school started. Um, mm. What's the school called? Was, it's called Goldridge. Sure. Goldridge Primary School. Yeah. So sure. um, I went here and I said, you know, I've, I've got a degree. Um, is there anything that I can do in administration? I've got a business degree. And so they put me in the admin office. I was helping with accounts, which I didn't, I didn't really enjoy but again, it was just, I love that being that you, you're dealing with parents and you're dealing with teachers and kids and school mm. is such a, such a great vibe of, you mm. know. Um, and then I used to escape from the office um, to go and take, say, Sraya, can you just watch my class? Um, you know, I've done all the work for them and can you just do this? Uh, take mm. care of them while I go to the doctor or whatever. I used to mm. love those things. So I used to substitute teach, sneak out of the office and substitute teach. And then um, I told him, uh, I told the administration, I was like, well, you know, can I, can I have like one lesson a day where I teach art? Like just one lesson a day where I go to a, a different class and I teach them art. Um, and they were like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, and so I did that. I became an art teacher. Um, so every day I'd get like a little 30 minute, yep. 45 minute escape from the office to teach these kids art. Mm. Mm-hmm. And was the art there at the time? Was the art there at the time or, or not really? No, I mean, it was one teacher for everything. So they were they were quite happy to have me <laughs> because at the time, the only, you know, they they would only have a break when it was the PE teacher taking PE and the Shana teacher taking Shana. Otherwise, Shana, they used to yes. do music. They used to do every subject. Wow, wow. Right. Like, oh, yeah, you've got an art teacher now. Um, I didn't mm. get paid any extra for it. But sure, um, mm. But it was fun, and I I was actually I actually felt like I was enjoying it. At the same time, I was I was home with my with my family. I was learning. My dad was running a business um, in Quickly. I'm sure you know about the the stereotypical Indian corner shop. It was literally yes. one of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but yes. but you you learn such skills from from Absolutely. you know just family, just a, a simple family business. Um, there's so mm-hmm. much. That you um, so it was great. I, I spent time with him there and I spent time with my mom, which mm-hmm. was amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. And so that's how I kind of got, got into the, in my interest in life in school. It mm-hmm. was just totally random. It wasn't my plan. It was never my ambition. It was never my goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's how I became a teacher. When I got married, um, I, I literally live around the corner from a primary school here. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I wonder if, you know, I'm, I'm not a qualified teacher, but I do have a degree maybe. Mm. And yeah, I, I ended up teaching um, at Sharon School for seven years. Yes. And yeah. And that was that. Was that, was that. I, I got my, my postgraduate um, in education. So yes. yeah, I've, I've got my degree in, in business, industrial psychology, and I've got a postgraduate in, in um, education. And yeah, again, I, 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 I passed. I did really, really well in it because I just, I loved it. I read those books like it was, like it was just entertainment. <laughs> and yeah, what is it? What, what is it about teaching that you like the most? Is it a, Is it? Is it the ability to, to almost nurture a child's uh, gifts, or is it even goes beyond that? What is it the most thing that you know? What drives you there? Um, it's about perspective shifting perspective and it's something that if you can do that you get such a you can get such a kick out of it um Mm. when people are and i think this is a result of my own um 
uh, my own journey is mm. teachers mm. who've impacted me, lecturers who've impacted me. Um, mm. I think throughout my life, I've just been held and um, helped by the most amazing people. And mm. I like to think that this is true for everybody. Um, and maybe, maybe, we, maybe we don't even realize how many good people we've had. Um, maybe mm. we haven't listened to them or maybe we've forgotten about them. But all through my life, I mean, I, I recently, well, not recently, but a few years ago, I, I did a substitute teaching at a school and I was teaching next to my grade seven teacher. Full circle. Like, yeah. What is that? <laughs> she's like, yes. And, and she, she'd tell everyone in the staff room all these funny stories about me. And I just had to turn up. I said, you know, you were so amazing. Like, a teacher can literally be life changing. They can a teacher mm. can totally break you, or mm. they can really make you. Um, mm -hmm. I just think that the impact it's 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 almost. I'm going to be shot for this, but it's almost second to parenthood. If I look at my kids right. now going to school, they mm -hmm. actually spend more hours of the day with their teacher than they do with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. And so it, it's a very, very important, a very, very important um, role. It's not something that you, that you do for the glory. You don't do it for the money. You don't do it. You don't do it for anything. It's, it's love. That you, you actually love, you actually love doing it. Um, mm. And yeah, so if, if anybody, um, it's very difficult to, I think, to find a teacher who does it for any other reason, because why would you, why would you want to be, um, you know, underpaid and <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Do you find it yeah, purposeful? I, Do you find maybe. it purposeful? I know, I know. For example, my 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 missus, she's she's a teacher, and there's often that angst of, um, and uh, and all of her family are in finance. They're all in finance and bankers and whatever. And then she always feels like I'm the artsy teacher, and I'm fully. And she, you know. Someone is just fully invested and loves what they do. And you look at them, you're like, geez, this person shouldn't be doing anything else but this. But they have this yeah. angst, which is, but I sometimes feel out of place with my finance family because they're all accountants and bankers and I feel um, out of place. So yeah, what words of encouragement could you give to someone who wants to do that path, but societal pressure might be like money, this, this and that, do you know? From a former perspective, uh, what words of encouragement would you have? Yeah, it, just, it just sounds so so cliche when you just say be yourself you know mm. um i think we forget that we have one life i don't know like sometimes <laughs> yeah we think oh in the next yeah. life or the third fourth no this is the only <laughs> life that, that, like yeah. when when mm. what <laughs> you're suddenly 40 years old and you're like i'm in a i'm in a a, a job i hate i'm i'm, I'm and for for what? For whom? You know, for whom? Um, so, and so, like I said, nobody, sometimes people don't even put pressure on you. Sometimes you put that it's pressure you. on yourself, you know? Like I, this whole time I was putting pressure on myself. If I'm not in the sciences, mm -hmm. no one is going to, you know, I'm going to have absolutely no, um, yeah, I'm going to have no status and no one's going to take me seriously. And I am an academic I, you know, I, and, mm, you know mm. science, and you have mm. all these ideas, which is just so absurd, but the mm. world is full of different people and the mm. world wouldn't be what it is if we didn't have all these, all these different people. And I think especially the arts. So I'm not only talking about uh, teaching, but, but the arts in general, I mean, I don't know if it was the same for you, but growing up, you just keep hearing BA is a, a, a bugger all or a bugger all a bugger all in <laughs> a bugger all. don't get a ba you know and so mm. it was like oh that's like way beneath never definitely not going to get that and so there's mm. no absolutely no credit given to um to the arts to humanities to, to none of that you know um social mm. sciences and um again it's about what you 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 hear one thing or you get one little perception when you were young or whenever and you, it mm -hmm. sticks with you and it grows and it grows and, you know. Um, and like I said, it, you can even get to the point where you just 
you on that trajectory and if you're successful all the way you can go all the way to the end hey you mm. can go all the way to the end and you never and actually get to the top end. and say i hate you, this i hate, I hate this. this and you've never had the you've never had the 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 luck of failing because when you fail you actually failing can be so lucky because when you fail you actually have to sit with yourself and say is this even what i want this is not even what I, this is not even me. Mm. Because you have, this, you have this plan, your car is sailing down this path and it's not even your path. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, so, what is, yeah, for sure. You said the luck of failing. Failure can be a yeah. gift in some ways. Like, let's just pause and take stock because we're going, where are we, what, why are we even doing this? For what and for who? You know? Yeah. For what and for whom? And, you know, like, are they feeding you? Are they, what are they going to do? And you know what? It, it comes to, it comes to like, I think when I didn't get my white blazer, it was one person, one person who rubbed it in that I didn't get a white blazer. One. Nobody else said anything. Nobody yes. else said anything. My parents were, were totally understanding because I, was, I wasn't well that year. Um, but they were very strict with my studies. They, they you know, they always... They, yeah, I think they, pushed. they more, more emphasized the work ethic. They didn't want me to be lazy. They didn't want me to not always try my best. So the work ethic was always pushed. But I think there was, there was one, and I, I dreaded her. I, I, I knew this auntie was going to come and I knew she was going to rub it in my face about, <laughs> about me not getting a white blazer. And she did. And it was actually okay. It was, <laughs> I know. You know, I don't know what. What do you think? What What exactly do you think is going to happen when these people come and say you failed, you're mm. a failure? Like, mm. okay, and now what? Nothing. Absolutely yeah. nothing. The sun will still shine. It will still, you know. Life will continue to go on the next day as it does often. Fully. I I, I think my advice is just find what makes you happy find out if um if the journey to get you to do that will make you happy too so you can say um i want to be um i want to be a doctor that's what is going to make me happy that's you know but then you've also got to you've got to measure the journey that that it will take to get there um what kind of sacrifices are you going to make what kind of lifestyle are you going to have to have until you get to that um, because that also matters. So yeah. I, I often think about this um, when we talk about our kids. Now, my children are still in primary school, but mm. childhood is life. Your years of study is also life. People mustn't think that life only starts once you're qualified, once yes. you're married, once yes. you've, you've got. I can start my life. I finish high school, then I start my life. Or what? But no. Mm. exactly mm. childhood is life your years of study is your life that's still you know that's still life the, when, when we talk about children struggling through this pandemic you know people are always like their future their future and i was like what about they now <laughs> they're present yeah what, what about, about their, their present? present what about mm. they, we have to make we have to make their present pleasant as well mm. Mm. sacrifice and make the sacrifice and absolutely, you should make sacrifice, but you still have to have that balance of having life as well. Life still mm. goes on. And again, this mm. is so much about what Kites for Peace is about. It's about mm. finding those little moments of joy, finding, you know, without excuses. I mm. don't have the time. That is the biggest excuse we use for everything. Everything, yeah. Everything. I can't exercise because I don't have time. I can't do this. I can't eat right. I can't cook right. I can't. You find the things. time if it's important. You should, the time should be found. Mm. Yeah, mm. but no one ever prioritizes joy. No one ever prioritizes leisure. No one ever mm. prioritizes, there's, there's no balance, you know. No one mm. ever prioritizes these things, but it's, it's an investment. It's an investment in, in your spirit. It's an investment in your mind. It's, it's actually an investment in your physical well-being as well is mm. to find to find these moments and to actually invest in them and so when 
when I talk about this, people think I'm talking about having bubble baths with candles. It's not about that. At all. It's not about that at all. I don't even know what that's like. But you know, it's absurd. Um, um, like, yeah, but such a first what, world. Thing, first world thing you put candle, scented candles with 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 yeah, yeah with, with exactly. the aromatherapy. Yeah. Like, what, what are you talking about? But it, it's it's not about that at all. Um, it's about yeah. finding what yeah. you what do you find joyful. So again, it might just be picking up the phone and talking to your crazy friend. Mm. You know, um, whatever joy means to you. So people always say to me, "Oh, is is it uh, kites and kites?" And I'm like, "Yeah, kites. Maybe you want to do skateboarding. Maybe maybe you want to do soccer. Maybe mm. you I don't know what what makes you happy." Are you doing enough this, of what me? Mm, mm, there's this idea, and I think it's so poignant to that. There's this idea of of joy, but then sometimes joy comes from pain, or or well, the 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 lessons that can be learned from pain, if I can call it that, right? If I can call it that. And um, you mentioned, of course, there's there was the coma, and then there's the pain of not maybe getting a white blazer. But I think more importantly, I was reading around you losing your mother, and that bringing a sense of facing your mortality and the idea of legacy do you know what i mean um what uh, i think uh, is my my assumption i don't want to put it on you but i think that had a huge impact in terms of the route you've taken into with a lot of the work that you do right now so maybe talk about that moment and what that meant for your trajectory to date okay so i think i think i've always been aware of my mortality as as a diabetic Mm. I've always been conscious of that. And again, mm. um, with all these doomsayers saying, you can die, you, you almost died. Um, mm. You know, this is going to, this bad thing's going to happen. I, I've always been aware of my mortality, that mm-hmm. life, life is, uh, you not everybody's going to live to, my, my grandfather lived to 92. I might wow. not, you know, I, yeah, I, I might not get, mm. um, my mother mm-hmm. died at 60, 67. Um, wow. I, you know, I might be lucky to get there. So mm-hmm. I think I've always been aware of my mortality. Um, my, my path on Kites for Peace started the year my mother died. So mm. I was a really, I was a really um, in that. I, I, le- I had left teaching um, two years before. And I, mm-hmm. um, again, <laughs> so much of my story is things that happened to me um, mm. that I turn um, into something that I actually wanted. So nothing, yes. none of this was actually what I wanted, but when I had, when I had something, I actually wanted it. So it's almost like this mental thing of, um, like, like I said, wanting what you have. So I didn't want to be a teacher, but then I became a teacher and I wanted to be a teacher. Mm. Um, I didn't, uh, uh when, when I became a mother, um, Literally, this is the story of my business. I, I started um, selling tables from my garage because um, we needed to pay for diapers. Diapers are hellish expensive. It exp- <laughs> it's so expensive. I'm, like, I, I'm not earning anything. I need, to, I need to just have some side hustle. I just need to mm. have a side hustle. I've seen these mm. um, folding tables and I'm going to do this. And um, I just need a, a little bit of pocket money and I'm going to go back into teaching right? Because now yes, this is where yes. I think my life is leading. So I started my business and then suddenly um, I was, I'd sold, I'd sold them and then I was selling a couple more. And then somebody saw my, my um, tables at a, um, at a Brian and said, Oh, I think old mutual would really love these. And they were looking for something like this. Suddenly get a phone mm. call from old mutual and they're like, Oh yeah, those tables you're selling. Do you have a, do you have a VAT certificate? Are you registered? <laughs> Yeah. So it snowballed overnight. Like, oh gosh, this is a business. It's a business. Yeah. It's a business. I suddenly, I need, I need a shelf company. I need a name. I need to register for that. It's not, it's not, this is not just some side hassle now. This yes, is a real it's, thing. It's I, need a... I need to invoice mm. people. Um, mm. And so we started doing that. Um, and then the business just grew. And again, mm. it's not what I, I didn't want it, but it, it happened and I wanted it. I wanted mm. what was happening. I, I wanted mm-hmm. that. And mm. um, 
Um, my business training had some impact in it. Um, so much of so much of business in Zimbabwe is about how personable you are, how personable your brand yes. is. Um, yes. I think I sensed that. Um, and so I really worked hard on that aspect. Um, nine years later, I'm still, I'm still selling tables and chairs, holding tables and chairs. We're still doing okay. You know, um, mm. it, it's an achievement. Like in the first world, it doesn't seem like an achievement if I have to show you my turnover. It's, but the fact that we're still alive, <laughs> we are doing trading. Still open. Mm. It's still trading. It's it's an mm. achievement for small business in Zim. Um, mm. Anyway, so I'm I'm getting sidetracked. But um, two years into my business, I again I was feeling like I needed more. I needed more fulfillment. It was going really well. Um, I was happy, and then I was like, I can actually spend time doing all these other things that I want to do. My kids are small. I want to do something that. Um, might be interesting for them. And mm. when Kites for Peace came up again, totally fell into it by mistake. I literally just organized a, uh, a picnic at, um, mm. at the lake. Mm -hmm. And I invited a couple of friends and I said, we're flying kites and we're flying kites for peace. Somebody's trying to break, break the world record for flying kites and we're going to be a part of it. And I'm going to just count how many kites you guys all bring and I'm going to send our number in and just say, this is Zimbabwe for kites. This is the number. Sure. This is the number. And mm. um, the world record was broken um, the following year. Um, and I was like, okay, well, that's it. That was fun. Um, mm. And then people were like, no, we still want to have an event. Let's have an event next year on Tuesday, mm. you know? I was like, yeah, okay, mm. cool, let's do it. And that's how it became a thing. Um, but that first year when, um, just after the, it was actually about a month after the first Kites for Peace event, um, when my mom passed, what was really, um, it was, my mom is the first close person that I've lost. And what sure. I noticed, uh, what I noticed um, at, you know, the, the time of her passing and, and was that what really mattered was when we spoke about her, we spoke, when, when people came to sympathize with us, they spoke about, I always remember this one neighbor who said, you know, your mother, um, was taking a walk um, one day and she saw me pulling out my rose bushes and I was going to mm. throw them away because I was, they were unsuccessful. And my mother said, don't, don't throw away those bushes. I will help you. I'll teach you how to prune your bushes. I'll teach you how to take care of your rose bushes. Mm. And your mother used to come and visit me every day and then every week to show me how to use, how to do this and look at my room. Mm. And I just think it, it was there was nothing, all it was, was her time and her care and her, it was her, she was sharing her knowledge. She was just mm. being a neighbor. She was literally mm. just being, being a neighbor. A neighbor. Mm. Just being a neighbor. She was being a neighbor. Mm. She was being friendly. And that was one of the most touching things that anybody has said to me about my mother is your mom gave me time, you know? Mm. And I just thought, like nobody nobody came and said oh your mom donated five thousand rands to this mm, or mm. you know your mom was a big donor of, i mean those things count they count for a lot but what was really 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 touched me was that she gave of herself and she gave of her time and there were so many stories like that so so many stories um mm. And that's why I felt like my mom could rest in peace, knowing um, she, she did die. To me, she died at a very young age. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I, obviously I was sad that I was going to miss her and that she, she could have still had a, a good many more years left. But to me, I, was, I found peace in that she had, she had lived a full life. She had, she had loved you know, she didn't only love her family, but she loved, she loved others and she, she passed that on. And that's really all we really take with us is how much we've, how much we've loved, how much we've impacted people, how much we've helped people and, and made life more mm. bearable for someone. For, for this neighbor, it was just a rose bush. But for, for the neighbor, it was more than just a, a rose bush. It was somebody that actually cared for her, you know. So mm. 
that's when, yeah, that's when kind of my perspective also really shifted. And I said, no, I'm aware that I could die. I could die at any time. I've always been aware of that. Um, mm. What, what am I, what am I, if I have to die next year or if I have to die mm. next week, would I be happy um, leaving, leaving what I'm leaving? So we always think about, when we talk about um, a, a legacy, we always think yes. about it in terms of money. How much money yes. am I going to, how much money am I going to leave for my children? How much, mm. you know, um, what am I going to leave? What kind of empire am I going to leave? And mm. that is very, very important. And that gives you a lot of peace of mind knowing that your children are taken care of, your family is taken care of, and that they're never going to struggle or suffer. So that's mm. very important. But it's also important to leave a legacy, um, to have imparted your life experience, to impart knowledge to your children. Mm. and to others, you know so mm. if you if you've worked through a difficult thing in your head if you work mm. through a difficult experience like like grief or loss or failure yes and yes you've been able to work through it how can your story help someone else and mm. this is um, this is something that's more it can be more valuable than gold mm. um helping somebody through something. Um, mm. it, it doesn't have to be a six-week course. It can mm. be a, a five-minute conversation with somebody. And that's happened mm. to me as well. You know, um, mm. the other day, somebody messaged me after seven years. I looked, I scrolled down in my messenger and I was like, gosh, the last time this person messaged me was like seven years ago. Seven years, like, yeah. But she's like, Sarah, do you remember that time when you told me this and you told me don't give up and you, you gave me some advice on this? She's like, I always remember that. And I'm like, I can't even remember who this person is. <laughs> and you're just, yeah, you're just leaving these little little bits of goodness in the mm. world. And um, it's not about, oh, when you die, you're going to have this fancy funeral. I don't know. I'm going to be dead. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> You'll be in the grave. Be. Who knows? Why would, I, yeah. why, would I, why would I care about what kind of party everybody's going to have and what people are going to say about me on social media and what kind of, um, you know, memorial I'm going to have. I, I'm not going to worry about it. Why should I worry about that? But worry mm. about it now because it, it puts me more at ease. It puts the idea of dying. Um, it's much easier. If mm. I know I've died, having lived a purpose and having lived a meaningful life and having lived a life where, um, for me, it's helping people. For me, it's it's yes. how people through things I've struggled with. Um, so if I die tomorrow, I'm good. You guys can throw your party and your memorial, whatever you want to say, whatever you want. <laughs> but but right now, I know that if I die, I'm okay with it now. Yes, I'm okay with it because um, I've 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 done. I've done all I, that I can do up, up until now. I'd, I'd like to li to live for another fifty years. It, it, of course. It won't happen. But if I live for another fifty years, great. But if I don't, I know that what I've done up until now, it's enough. And I'm kind of I found my peace with my mortality, mm. Um, mm. because I feel like I'm living a, a life of purpose. And does that make sense? That's a beautiful thing. I abs absolutely to answer your question. Um, and firstly, the story you told about your mother was was beautiful. By the way, it's it's a small story, but it speaks to a much larger idea of the of of helping your neighbor. It's so pertinent. And on, on your last point, you you speak about this idea of living a life full with purpose. I was watching this um, interview of a musician that I like, and he talks about this this notion that for the most part we look at life. Most people approach life from a perspective of what can I get from life? Like what can I accumulate and amass and get? Um, whereas we should rather look at the, op the opposite, which is rather what can I give? And whilst we're here, how can we empty ourselves fully? So that whether we're to go at 30 or 35 or 40, you at least live empty. You've, you've literally yeah. outpoured your cup into everyone else and you can leave fulfilled. But some people yeah. might might be like, oh, do me, Sarah, or that's nice and all. 
Um, but I work a full-time job. I do all of these two things. And the reason I wanted to ask you to say what that looks like is, or how is that manageable? Because you run a business, but you're also at the same time um, pouring out your cup, if I can call it that, you know? So is that manageable? Someone might be like, I want to give, but I don't know how to realistically do that, you know? So what does that look like for you? Is it just managing? Is it manageable? Is it unrealistic? Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer because it, it, cha- mm. it's different for everyone. And for me, it's mm. continually changing. There's mm. sometimes where I'm just so, uh, my cup is overflowing and I have lots to give. Um, and then there's times where I just can't, I can't cope within myself. And that's mm. when my team and my people come in and mm. it's so important to have those. Um, people mm. who, who, who not, who don't invest in your dream, but you share the dream with them. So mm. you, you, mm. you know, you're always talking about it, and you're like, "Yeah, we want to do this," and you agree, like, "This is what we're going to do." And then you understand, like, um, people have lives. We've got, we've got things going on. Sometimes we will have a crisis, and that's yeah. when you need to depend on other people. So you, you need people to hold space for you. Um, that's that's another thing is, is that trust um, that you need to have. Um, in 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 letting other people um, letting other people uh, kind of uh, mm. carry the torch for you for a while, but yeah, no, mm. absolutely, giving yourself. I always say you can't. I mean, again, it's 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 an old adage, you know. Um, you can't give from an empty cup, so mm. make sure that you're full and your your overflow. You give from your you give from your overflow, um, mm. and yeah, it's. It's, it's realistic according to not everybody can do it. Not everybody knows how to do it. But you find some people who just. Wow. They just mm. don't they don't even know where to start. Like mm. what? You know, people will just message me and they're like, I want to volunteer. And you're like, OK, what would you like to do? I don't know. <laughs> and they literally want they literally want you to tell them what to do. And then I have to have this whole interview with them and I'll say, what are you good at? What do you like? Do you like animals? Do you like children? Do you like, what do you like doing? Mm. You know, um, and then we'll go through the whole, all the whole process and I'll say, oh, okay, I know an organization um, that really needs somebody to do this or, or whatever, um, whether it's putting pavers outside or whether it's, it's um, uh, babysitting kids or whether it's walking I'm walking the dogs that are that are in cages all day. You know, I mean, there's there there is, and, and people always worry that if they volunteer, then they're going to be committing a lot to the. You know, will mm. I be able to manage? Um, mm. And it it doesn't have to be that way. You give when you can. We give what you can when you can. And mm. actually, this is quite this is very interesting. Um, mm. You actually feel. I actually feel that volunteering your time, your knowledge, and that sort of thing, sort of like what I do with, with, my, with my teaching, mm-hmm. um, is it actually, uh, it actually gives you, it actually gives you more. So you, you feel like you're giving, but actually mm. you get quite a lot in return. I remember the first time I visited an old age home here, yeah, I mm. had this whole idea that I'm going to go do this wonderful amazing thing for these old people and they're going to be so grateful (laughs) that i i came i sacrificed my saturday afternoon to talk to be with them and i thought Mm. i was all high and mighty i went there with cakes and everything i tell you do me i came out of there and i felt like a million bucks Mm. it was the Mm. most amazing experience they they all wanted to talk to me they, there was no effort in, in talking. There was some ladies were giving me recipes and mm. some were giving me advice with my children. And then, you know, I mean, mm. it was just mm. so much. And I had an old man ask me if I wanted to play chess with him. And I just, I came out of there and I was like, wow, I felt really, really good. Um, and I felt inspired and I felt energized. And the rest of my week went really, really well. Okay, what am I going to do this weekend? Because I want that high again. Because it felt so good for me. Um, meanwhile, I thought I was going to be going there to do them a favor. But I came out of it. I felt really good. 
you know. Phenomenal. Um, on that point. It was, it was nothing. It was it was literally like three mm -hmm. hours and I baked a, a banana bread or a carrot cake or something. And that's all it cost me. But I was, it felt really good. And, and it can become really addictive, this, this feeling of, of doing and making a change. And I know, and then the rest of that week, I was getting messages, Saraya, your visit was so great. They're still talking about it. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> like, really? yes. um, you know I, I felt so great. I even, I, I'll send you the, I'll send you the post about it. I posted about it. And I was like, I can't believe, I can't believe how great this <laughs> is. I thought it was going to be a boring afternoon with like boring old people, but they were fun. Oh, it was <laughs> fun. So good, uh, yeah. Two, um, two, two things. It, it, two it's, it's about making that difference, how you feel um, when you feel like you, so that was just an example of old people, but when you see a problem and you feel like you can be part of the solution, it actually energizes you because these things work on our, on our mind. You know, you, you read about um, our poverty rate, you read about hunger, you read about all of these things. When you actually do something towards solving that problem, you can kind of have a little bit of peace of mind, which gives you clarity in your work. Mm. So you say, I am so busy with work. I don't have time to think about starving children. Mm. Well, actually, you are thinking about it because you know about it. It's still there. It's working on you. If you mm -hmm. do something, if you manage your time, just a little bit of time to do something about that problem, it will actually give you a little bit of peace of mind so that you can now focus properly on and it will energize you and it will inspire you, um, you know. So again, giving can also be quite a selfish thing, you know. So it's mm. is the gift is a gift in giving um, that we we should be aware of. Fully, I think that's so important because I sometimes get um, I wrestle with this idea of you know the idea of of charity or what have you. Where sometimes it becomes a case where it's a lob, it's a one sided. Uh, relationship sometimes where where the person just thinks it's donate give 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 donate donate but i feel like well geez when when the relationship becomes lopsided you end up saying the person that is re the receiver almost is just a person who's just living with their hands out but you watch from what you're saying it's like no that's not the case the receiver also has something to give as well and that you know and that's through the time that you're spending with them they get in power but then they also fill your cup it's two it's a two-way relationship it's not just a, a single sided which i think is very interesting you know you, you you need to you need to be open to receive those gifts though as well and again as as a teacher um i get this and and i when i speak to my teacher friends we get this all the time and we say gosh our kids teach us so much like we're meant to be teaching our kids but they teach us so much Mm -hmm. us so much and it's not only oh we love you and we think you're so pretty or whatever well that nonsense they really really give your kids really give and it's the same with um when you um when you when you help out a cause you can if you can see a difference you're getting something you've actually you've actually achieved something um and that's why volunteering is it's so important um, because those small measures of achievement can go so much towards building your self-confidence. Um, that's why I encourage youth all the time, do something, make some kind of change, because this is actually something that you can succeed in. You can actually see results in it. And you see a little bit of, um, you see a little bit of success in, in the difference that you're trying to make with your time or with, with whatever you're giving. Um, that can build your confidence um, in, in other areas of your life. Um, mm. So yeah, abs absolutely. The, the beneficiaries of um, whatever you're giving absolutely have something to give you, but you have to be open um, to receiving it, to recognizing it, and to, be, to receive mm. it. Um, and it's, it's, more than just a, it's more than just a thank you. It's, it's, it's so much more. It's so much it's more. Big. It's so much more. Yeah, I want to wrap up now because I'm sure you have a family and and to attend to. But there's but the actually, actually <laughs> alone. I'm actually alone this afternoon, which is um, <laughs> which is it's really rare. <laughs> it's very <really>, rare. Yeah. <laughs> but the what I wanted to kind of two things I want to just end off on, which is 
man, I think firstly, your story is extremely inspiring and just kind of really speaks on what it means to be connected to the community and use your time and disappointments to kind of reshift, you know, how you engage with yourself um, and the world, right? Um, the question I have for, for you is like one, you know, on the Zimbabwe Cares Network, I feel like it consolidates all of these causes that you've been exposed to. And there are going to be people that will be listening to this who will be similarly to your friend to be like, oh, Sarai, I want to, so I want to give, I don't know what to do. So I guess the first point is like, tell us about this Zimbabwe Cares Network. And then two, it could be myself. It could be anyone else who's listening. How can we give our time of our resources? What does that process look like? So those two things. Okay, so um, obviously, so we were talking about this disconnect with the diaspora before. Um, one way to connect and to feel like you're making a difference here is to get involved in these, in these charities. So that, it doesn't always have to be money. So we, we don't always encourage money. We encourage other things like time, connections, um, just general exposure, telling people about what um, these people are doing on the ground. Uh, so the Zimbabwe Kids Network is, it's not an organization. We don't, we don't accept money. We don't broker the deals for you or anything. What we do is we're just a support network. Um, and these people, we, we all kind of work together. So if I give you a name, if you come to me and say, Suraya, um, I'm really interested in the autism cause. Um, you know, I, my, my friends, my, my godchild is, is autistic and I really I understand like the challenges um, that come with it. I'm thinking about the autistic children in um, Zimbabwe. How can I help? How can I help mm. children with autism in Zimbabwe? And I can say to you, oh, yes, I know. Um, and I'll give you a name. And, and all, these, all these people that we work with, um, they are, they're all registered. Um, they all have great track records. And so it's really, it's, it's a little bit about trust, but you're not also not giving to something that you're not, um, that is just like some, a random name that you found in a book. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, so yes. It's, it's, it's something that's been verified and it's been trusted and lots of people can vouch for them. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what I can do is I'm going to send you a list of, um, of some of the, the, um, the charities that do mm -hmm. have, um, mm -hmm. Uh, ways that you can support from outside. Um, obviously, it's very difficult for you to be involved from over there to to give your time. Um, but you know, um, your your dollar or your pound does go a very very long way in Zimbabwe. Um, they really make it stretch. Um, but but also, you know, there are other ways you can contact them and say, how can we um, shine a light on your on the work that you're doing. Um, mm. when we started the Zimbabwe Cares Network, the idea wasn't to, uh, to highlight the usual, you know, when people think about donating to Zimbabwe, it's always the usual, the big five. There's like five charities that everybody keeps donating to. And that's yes. great. And yeah. It's really great. Um, and those charities are doing a lot. But you've got like, we've literally got about 100 different causes. I can give you off the top of my head, 100 different causes that... Um, people are working in. People are actually, they, they don't have money for marketing. They don't have money to, to make fancy logos and to have, um, you know, uh, great websites or whatever. So what we do is through our work, uh, as we work together, uh, it kind of gives them a little bit of um, le legitimacy is for lack of a mm. better word, a little bit of legitimacy to say, okay, look, these guys are not really big. Um, but we can vouch for them. We've worked with them for five years. And mm. um, I can tell you that all the money or whatever, it's not going to just disappear into the name. Uh, so that was the idea was to kind of shine, shine a light on the grassroots organizations. Um, the ones where people like literally just say, I don't know how to do this, but all I know is I want to help. Um, so yeah, any, any cause um, that, you, that you have, um, you can contact us on um, on our on. You can contact me on my website, which Your is website. Sure. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's uh, www.flykitesforpeacezim.com, and 
um, yeah, otherwise you find us all over Facebook um, and you can just contact us and say, look, um, I, I would like to support this in Zimbabwe. Can you put me in touch with the right people? And chances are that um, there's already somebody who's already doing a lot of work and could really uh, do with your support. And again, it's not only um, financial support, but, but anything that you have. Um, you know, if you want to sponsor a website, if you want to design a logo for them, that kind of stuff is really helpful. You know, um, you want to do a, a, a feature on them or a, a podcast like this. It's really, really mm -hmm. helpful um, in just mm -hmm. in bringing these things out and, and, and highlighting the work that they do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you um, a list um, with uh, donation links and um, website links or whatever so people can have a look um, and see. But yeah, the, the website pretty much has all the organizations um, listed there and, and all the categories, yeah. Thank you so much. And then to end off, I guess, from my side, you know, I, I was reading, I was listening to an interview that you did recently and you spoke of suicide is up, depression is up, and everyone is jaded. Everyone is very jaded, which I found very jarring, but true at the same time, because you can't run away from the truth. It is what it is. Um, you and the Zimbabwe Cares Network and, you know, everyone that is working actively towards, you know, trying to shift this narrative. I guess the question I have is like, what does shifting the narrative look like for you? Because it can't end at a jaded reality of suicide and depression. It has, there has to be some glimmer. And you spoke about in that same interview about, I think you said sharing sh shreds of light, shreds of light to people. So the question is like, what does shifting this narrative look like to you? Because things have to collectively get better, right? So what does that look like for you? Okay, so there's a there's a famous story about um, about the little boy who um, who was in the car with his mother and he and they drove past an accident and he was um, very distressed and his mom said to him, uh, "Don't look at that. Look at the helpers. It's a big it's a big accident. It's terrible, but look at how he felt like." you know, um, it's okay, it's, it's gonna be okay. It's something terrible has happened, but look at all these people that are helping. And mm. um, that, is a, that is the perspective um, that the Zimbabwe Cares Network, I mean, just personally speaking so many times, um, you know, when I'm feeling really down and just totally out of hope. Um, and then I'll, I'll just look there and somebody will be saying, oh, we, we're doing this today, or we, we've done this, or look at this donation we got, and, and we did an, a medical outreach or whatever it is. And I'm just like, wow, these mm. people are in the same, we're in the same Zimbabwe. We're in the same boat, but look at them. I'm sitting here and I'm utterly miserable, but these people are out there going out on our terrible roads and they're going with, with cooler boxes full of medicine and they're going, but you know, with all this stuff and they're going and they're helping people. Why? You know, they don't, they don't have to, <laughs> they don't have mm. to, but mm. they're doing it. And you look at, you look at these selfless people and you think this is the, this is the, the glimmer of, of light. You, this situation mm. is so terrible and it's so easy to just give up. Um, but uh, you, when you look at, you look at people like this and you say, wow, these are the helpers. This, this, this is the light. These people that are still shining light. And sometimes mm. you'll shine your light and for them um, because they're not superheroes. I'm not a superhero. So sometimes, you know, I'll shine my light for them and then they'll shine their light. But as long mm. as there's some mm. source of light somewhere, we, mm. we're okay. So this is, this is the narrative is that, again, we keep focusing on, if we just focus only on the negative, and I'm not telling you to focus on the positive. I'm telling you, focus on the negative, acknowledge it, mm. and then look, look to the people who are helping the situation and get inspiration from them. Let them inspire you. Let them give you ideas of how you can help. And you can mm. help from everything from, it can be as much as giving, giving money, giving a whole heap of money to solve all of their problems, as big as that, or it can be as small as sharing a, a Facebook post of these, 
It can be that simple. Literally tapping your finger twice on your phone. That's all it takes. Um, and all of that means something. So when you're feeling, you're feeling like everything is terrible and everything is negative, look to the helpers and look for ideas of how you can do the same and how, you know, and it's just, it's just so great. Um, and, and Zimbabwe Kids Network, it's just, I'm literally looking at these people has, has saved me. It saved my mind and, and mm. many, many people too. I, I have, I have um, people who are members of the group and they say, Saraya, you know, I'm, I have no way of helping. Um, I'm out here in the UK or wherever. And I don't have a lot of money to give. But sometimes I just go into your page and I, I hear so much bad stuff about Zim. And sometimes I just go to your page to scroll and say, ah, oh, okay, those people are different. <laughs> oh, okay. like, it just mm. makes me feel better that everything is not totally burning. You know, I, I still feel like there's a glimmers of hope and there's, there's, still, there's still life and there's still life there. Mm. And again, it's, it's, it's keeping your mental strength. Um, and these mm. kind of things I, I can't help today but maybe tomorrow I'll help um, mm. and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to be like them you know so yeah <laughs> That's phenomenal. So prob don't focus on the problem or acknowledge the problem but also help the problem solver or be a problem solver you know yeah. and draw inspiration from that. Surya, this has yeah. been wonderful. Um, keep shining your light. I've had such a good time almost, you know, hearing about you and your story and all the work that you're doing. I will do my best to, one, not only just pay lip service to whether it's donating to any of the charities or well, even my time, because I think time is more important than money. Um, you know, I think that's even more important. And um, yeah, keep doing what you do. And, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much, Jimmy. This was, this was fun. The time just flew. Um, and now I, I probably have to get back to my to-do list. So um, <laughs> this was fun. Thank you so much for your time too.